edition of 2018 um, graphics project. I'm Yoon Jae Choi. Some of you may know me from either taking my class or maybe you're in my class this semester. I teach a class called um, graphic de uh, design and typography, which is a part of a bigger sequence called GAP, which, is, which stands for graphic architecture uh, project, um, along with Michael Rock. Um, so the GAP courses that my class is a part of have dealt with these ideas and, and skills that are required for you know, intentional and effective uh, visual presentation, whether that's about making images or uh, diagrams, slides, books, videos, or whatever the format may be. Um, and many of these themes will be covered over the next couple of, couple of weekends here in the Wood Auditorium and at Ware Lounge um, under the umbrella of um, what we're calling Graphics Project. So Graphics Project is an annual series of lectures, discussions, and portfolio reviews exploring the role of graphic design within the field of architecture. The goal is to examine various methods of visual communication used to convey concepts to both specialists and the general audience. Our short-term, more immediate goal is to help, you, uh, help and inspire you um, to think strategically about how you put your portfolios together, which as you know is a graduation requirement here at GSAP. But a more longer term goal and arguably a more important one, um, I think, is to provoke ways of thinking about visual presentation as a larger overarching concept with some, some longevity. Something you'll have to contend with as uh, professional uh, architects um, throughout your careers. Um, so these series of events aim to help students build a successful graduation portfolio while simultaneously unpacking the topics, tools, and trends of contemporary design. Um, over the next weeks, we'll investigate the minutia of glyphs and grids all the way up to structures and style, ranging from concrete concepts to perhaps more sort of grander, elusive ones. Um, you can refer to the graphic presentation graphics projects page on the GSAP website. There's lots of acronyms going on. Um, website for the scheduled events. Um, all events happen between 1 and 6 p.m. Um, so tomorrow will be Michael Rock from 2x4 presenting at 1, Tom Griffith from Everything Studio presenting at 3. Sunday is Juliet Cesar of Parsons, um, Greg Gaz Gazdowitz of Commercial Type, Dan Michelson of Link Buyer. Um, a studio that's responsible for the GSAP website that you guys are currently using and refer to every day. Next week, we offer a, uh, a couple of sessions of portfolio reviews um, for graduating students. Um, so sign-up sheets are in the back over there on the tables um, for you to, for you to uh, use um, if you are interested in signing up, make sure that you sign up for two sessions um, with group A and group B. Um, and make sure that the times don't collide because you can't be in two places at the same time. Um, I also want to thank uh, Forrest Jesse, who has been the, uh, the former director of the series um, graphic, Graphics Project, uh, for laying down such a solid foundation for the, for the series to have, for me to have inherited um, his commitment throughout the last few years have not gone Notice. And of course, thank you to all the speakers and reviewers who have agreed to share a portion of their precious weekends with us. Um, and so to kick off the series, uh, we start with um, a discussion, lectures and discussion called Architecture Unbound. Um, tonight's discussion is uh, between three New York-based designers, Yeju Choi, uh, Neil Donnelly, and Alex Lin. They're here to share a selection of their recent works. Um, while active and prolific in diverse content areas, all three designers have experience engaging very closely with architectural content, assuming multivalent roles as designer, researcher, editor, strategist, and so on. Each speaker will present and discuss projects they've completed in collaboration with storied studios and institutions such as the Canadian Centre for Architecture, the Cambridge Arts Council, OMA, WXY, WorkAC, Moss Architects, AIGA New York, and of course, Columbia GSAP. We'll have the opportunity to learn about their individual methods of dealing with issues such as typography, materiality, uh, and production, as well as the general practice of giving form to content and building a narrative through graphic design. 
Um, so I introduced the three speakers that are here today. Our first speaker, Yeju Choi, she is a designer and educator based in New York City. Uh, she runs a sm uh, small multidisciplinary design studio called Nowhere Office, focusing on projects in the public and cultural realm across various mediums, including printed matter, identities, websites, installations, as well as community-based public art projects. Previously, she has held positions at, um, as a design director at WXY and art director at Barney's New York. She received a BFA from Seoul National University and MFA from Yale. She has been teaching uh, at the graphic design department at Yale School of Art since 2013. Our second speaker is Neil Donnelly. Um, he works in graphic design across media with clients in art, architecture, publishing, and public service. His studio has a particular interest in designing flexible structures and systems that grow out of conceptual thinking and encourage deep engagement with content. They aim to surprise and delight readers, users, and visitors through careful consideration of materials, typography, and interactions. Clients include the Guggenheim, the Met, Cooper Hewitt, Work AC, Harvard University, the New York Times, and so on. Neil has lectured, taught courses, and led workshops at Yale School of Art, Harvard, GSD, Parsons, MICA, SVA, Rutgers, and other institutions. He holds a BS in engineering from Carnegie Mellon and an MFA in graphic design from Yale. Finally, our last speaker, Alex Lin, is the founder of Studio Lin, based in New York City, um, a graphic design studio that designs books, identities, websites for local and international clients. The current Studio Lin, Lin team is Jenna Myung, Sharon Gong, Yu Jun Zhu, and Louis Kang. So I will hand over the mic to our first speaker, Yeju Choi. Where is that? Can I sit down? Okay. Um, oh, thank you, Yun Jae. Um, okay, so I know I'm here to talk about 3D in 2D, sort of, right? Uh, but my presentation may seem more um, about 2D and 3D. Um, but I promise I'll make a point why, why that's relevant and important and maybe interesting. Um, so I'm still talking about graphic design or, or books, but I would like to focus on a rather specific aspect in thinking about uh, books. Where is, okay. Um, so this is, of course, uh, about the fact that a book is a physical, tangible object to be experienced, but also, because it exists in the three-dimensional world as a thing, um, there are all these other things around it which inevitably becomes uh, part of the experiencing of a book. I'm talking about the audience who's having that experience, the context that the experience is happening in, uh, the perspective through which the audience, is, uh, the audience sees the thing, both in a physical sense and otherwise. Um, tactility would be another thing, or temporality, um, so things like that. Well, it is by no means a new or unique way of uh, thinking about books. Uh, rather, it is inherent in the design process, at least I think so. Um, before I go further on that, I would like to show you some of my projects, old and new, and maybe that's helpful in understanding what I mean by thingness. Um, so for the past 10 years or so, I have worked um, somewhere in between art, architecture, graphic design, urban design, and planning in, in many different capacities. By that, um, I mean sometimes actually creating um, something that is actually spatial, structural, um, such as this public art project in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that um, integrates art into urban infrastructure. Um, it's a little video. So employing color, uh, colors and pattern, uh, and these sort of ambiguous three-dimensional structures, it encourages people to interact with their everyday mundane environment in a more um, active, 
creative way. Um, yeah. Um, or um, sometimes creating temporary urban in interventions like this. Um, this is in Lower East Side, uh, or was, it's taken down. Um, as you can see, I'm kind of interested in playing with perspective and distortion um, and illusion that it makes. And this project is specifically really about rethinking what fence um, could be, other than something that divides space into two. Can it be where people actually gather? Um, can it be something that you interact with and touch? Um, or creating a temporary space where community members communicate with each other. In this case, um, expressing gratitude towards people who helped them after Hurricane Sandy. Um, some of the things from that space. Or uh, sometimes actually just collecting stories about disappearing places or a sense of place, uh, making it into an archive um, or interactive audio tour, I would say, as part of a bigger placemaking project. Um, this is a really old project. Um, or sometimes using or subverting an existing architectural space um, to create a new sensory experience. Um, lastly, of course, making books about places, um, between places, place making, um, built environment, and lives within that built environment, issues, um, planning, Um, and this is another small publication documenting dialogues around public space in New York City. So here are the quotes on the left side um, are organized by the issues and themes in planning and color coded along the gutter, which you can kind of see here in the center fold uh, with an infographics of timeline of the milestone projects. This is another planning document in two different formats. Um, the one with the red spiral bound is a more comprehensive uh, document for stakeholders and partners. And then the larger uh, tabloid format is the condensed, more accessible document for the general public in um, two different languages. Uh, another planning document about uh, process from 2014. Okay, so I would like to talk about two or uh, one or two if I have time, um, projects in more details and kind of to circle back to the theme of this talk, um, the thingness. Uh, first is an identity project, which is perhaps the longest project that I have been working on with the New York-based architecture and planning firm WXY. And it, in a way, it's still ongoing. Um, unlike many other identity or branding projects where you design the whole system and kind of roll it out uh, simultaneously through different mediums. This project actually started in one medium for a very specific occasion. In 2010, I believe, um, the firm was invited to uh, participate in this exhibition in Seoul, Korea, where we had a small booth uh, space. and which is tiny, um, they decided to show only one bench, 
which barely fit in the space. So we decided to take the, the modules apart and use um, the reflective material, I believe that was mylar, uh, to virtually extend the bench in, this, in the space. And I mean, it's like a big convention hall. There are a lot of booths with like signage, a lot of boards, a lot of information. So I decided, I wanted to make a space that's just, you know, but where people can just sit and have conversations or just take, a, take some rest and just experience the bench. Um, but one kind of sneaky thing that I did, um, instead of having any signage uh, there, was to have this um, uh, newspaper format brochure, um, whatever you call it, um, available in the space. So people would naturally pick it up and open it in the space. So the size of this is crucial because I wanted it to be almost like a moving signage, right? So it has to be visible from far away. Uh, and also if you think about how people interact with like a bigger, uh, bigger scale publication uh, versus like a small book, because newspaper you have to kind of like hold it up so that the, the face, the front face is visible to, to others. Um, so the name of the firm, at this point, that wasn't even a logo. That was just part of the design of this publication. Um, it's placed vertically uh, along the spine and fold uh, to highlight the, the mirroring, the symmetry, um, connecting to what we were doing in the space. Um, but then that idea of having this built-in but invisible axis or the hinge uh, became the core of the identity of WXY. These are business cards. Um, I think I designed this maybe two or three years after the installation. Um, I thought it represented uh, WXY pretty well uh, and had a lot of potential because, well, it is, kind of it, it has the inherent three-dimensional or structural potential, and it has to be activated by the user, right? You have to open it. Um, it reveals the medium or the physicality of the medium it's on, um, and also it also makes you realize your own perspective because the form changes drastically based on your point of view. And of course, you know, being folded uh, means that there's something more to be revealed inside. And I was simply also just excited about the fact that you can place your business card kind of upright during meetings or whatever, like a tiny little structure, you can have fun with it. Um, and the website, again, I made this probably two years after the business cards. Um, in this case, of course, you cannot really fold the screen, right? Uh, but you, you, you can reveal the, the center line in a different way. Um, and you use that center line to organize information. In this case, on the left side of the logo is all firm information. The right side is all uh, projects. Um, this is I guess pretty recent, uh, a portfolio showcasing their 10 projects, some interior shots. But still playing with the changing form here. Um, same idea, uh, tote bag. I mean, a tote bag is flat when you're designing it, but then in real life, depending on what your what's in the bag, it changes the form, and also depending on how you're carrying it. Um, lastly, this is their office, and I should mention that I actually didn't do this. They did it. They put this up recently, um, and it it kind of made me happy that 
after just like relentlessly pushing this idea for maybe seven or eight years, they finally got it and they, they were using it in the way that I wanted them to use. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm showing this simplest sort of piece of graphic design. Uh, but when placed in the real world, uh, it takes on such flexible and multi-dimensional lives. Um, especially if you consider that and kind of engage that in your design process. Um, and I thought I should talk about this because I'm here. This is published by GSAP also. Um, um, how am I doing on the time? Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of the things that I mentioned so far uh, were very important in designing um, this book. I'm sure if I have kind of explained that, well, you kind of see what I'm talking about. Show, uh, th that's why I'm showing the, the book in a different, in many different way from many different angles. Um, so I should mention the idea of change or elevation uh, was very important. Um, something that I really wanted to bring out to the very fore in a kind of in your face way. This is a very poorly made video. Um, but you'll see it. So the gradation of the two colors also changes throughout the book, um, as well as, of course, like along the all four edges, uh, the color changes. So it looks different depending on your own perspective. I kind of wanted to show the flow of the book. So, um, so this idea of thingness, I mean, I have shown you examples mostly, you know, how that's manifested in the very sort of outermost surface, but really what I'm trying to say is that is something that you could or should think about when even, you know, organizing your information or doing your layout. Um, what's the most efficient uh, way of communicating certain ideas? What's the narrative? All based on whatever specific context that you're in or where you're going to show your book in. Um, yeah. I don't know. Was that helpful? I think that's, that's it. Um, so, hi, I'm Neil. <laughs> um, thank you very much to Yoonjae for asking me to be a part of this, and uh, also it's a real privilege to be here with uh, Yeju and, and Alex. Um, so I run a small, very small uh, studio in Brooklyn, um, and uh, it's me and one other designer, uh, Ben Furman Lee. Um, uh, who has contributed significantly to a couple of the projects that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but, you know, mostly we work with clients in art and architecture, and it tends to be people who um, are interested in ideas and are specifically coming to us because they're interested in um, the ideas that graphic design can add to their content or that, you know, can enhance it in some way. 
Um, and one of those ways that we often think about our ideas is and kind of work them out is through structure. Um, and structure is, is both a way of organizing material, but also I think for us um, often has like an expressive possibility um, that it can kind of um, do something more than just organize, that it can kind of complicate or enhance or um, kind of say something about the themes in the work that, that the material itself maybe can't say. Um, so there are four projects um, of ours that I want to talk about. Um, but before getting into those, I want to go back to Joseph Muller Brockman um, from 1981. This is from his book, Grid Systems and Graphic Design, um, which has long been one of my favorite images um, just because of its, uh, the expression of the kind of like utterly neurotic modernist. <laughs> um, that, like this entire environment can be boiled down into a, a really relentless grid. Um, to the degree that even like, you know, the recessed lighting in the ceiling is part of the grid. Uh, to me it just seems, uh, well I mean if anyone, anyone who's designed an exhibition sort of knows that this is total nonsense. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of more interested uh, than that way of thinking about structure, um, more interested in, in someone like Seal Floyer. Uh, who's an artist who's, who's, among other things, been doing this project for a very long time called Helix, um, which is just about using this um, Helix circle template, you know, for drawing circles of, of very specific diameters, um, but then using it as a frame for a collection of other objects. Um, you know, so she, she gathers these, these things that really have no business being together other than just that they all fit exactly into these holes. Um, and similarly, I think uh, Martino Gamper, um, a furniture designer, uh, who did a project called 100 Chairs in 100 Days and It's 100 Ways, um, in which he kind of set himself to the task of making 100 chairs in 100 days, but not by designing 100 chairs from scratch, but rather taking uh, pieces of different chairs and just kind of slamming them together to get these um, sort of mongrel pieces of furniture. And I think it's also worth considering um, some words from Anthony Frossog, a British designer from the 1970s, uh, from an essay of his called Design as an Exercise in Analogy. Now you can't make an analogy between two ideas which you have no property in, which have no property in common. You can't make things fit which aren't in them to fit. Indeed, it's the tragedy, if I can use so high-flown a word, of most design that the so-called solution has no reference to the requirements of the situation. Not just that it's badly designed, but, it, but that it's, so to say, quite beside the point, irrelevant. It's often the result of a designer seeing another designer's idea and being excited by it, trying to fit his meaning into an idea, a form which is quite inappropriate. Um, so, you know, while we're concerned with structure, I think it's structure that kind of grows out of some larger ideas um, related to the material we're working with, at least that's usually the goal. Um, so I'm going to talk about four projects. The first of them is a, a book for Work AC. Um, we'll get there when we cross that bridge, um, which was their first monograph. Um, and this is a project that I was working with them on for maybe a year and a half. Um, and they had been thinking about and working on for much, much longer than that. Um, and it was, I think, important to Dan and Amal to create a book that, that expressed something about their practice beyond just showing, showing the work itself. Um, and they had been referring to the book for a very long time as a duograph and not a monograph, as kind of a combination of their two voices. Um, and that plays out very literally in the text of the book. You know, it's, it's actually a kind of um, bracingly honest text, especially for an architecture monograph, um, about their practice and the ups and downs. Um, and it's a discussion between the two of them. And so that uh, duality kind of provides a, a structure for the book, but there are a couple of other structures um, at work here, and both of which you can actually see along the foredge of the book. Um, the book is divided into three eras, which are each indicated by three different fluorescent colors. Uh, and then also within those eras, there are um, 10 main projects that are kind of explored in depth. 
uh, followed by an issues section that there's kind of a larger idea that relates to um, the particular project that precedes it. Uh, and so the, um, the main projects are, are like a quarter inch shorter than the issues section, so you get this kind of stair step on the fore edge that um, gives the reader a very physical sense, um, to go back to Yeju's thingness, <laughs> of uh, the divisions in the book. Um, and so each of these three eras, or five-year plans, as Amal and Dan took to calling them, um, kind of explain uh, the issues and, and ups and downs of, of each of these five years. So the first, called Say Yes to Everything. Second, Make No Medium-Sized Plans. And third, Stuff the Envelope. Um, and each of these sections are introduced with um, you know, kind of more personal photographs and, and photos that are emblematic of the office culture and family and cakes that look like buildings. <laughs> uh, and then moving into the project sections, you know, there's kind of a dichotomy in the structure um, between the projects and the issues and that the projects are um, you know, kind of presented fairly traditionally and straightforwardly. Um, lots of big colorful images, sensible grids, um, and then the issue section that follows it breaks form from those, from those sections by um, kind of using different typography and, and they're much kind of looser and wilder than the project sections uh, with type kind of running around up and down between images. Um, and so this sense of uh, back and forth or kind of front of house and back of house was something that um, seemed very important to this project and finding a way to kind of squeeze them all into the same surface. Um, and at the end of the project, I went back and looked at um, one of the earliest pieces of material that came out of it, which was this diagram um, that Dan and Amal had made when we were first working on this that kind of divided the projects up into, into these sections in the kind of alternating um, you know, main project and, and issues sections. Um, and, and I think this, just as an artifact, is a pretty, um, is quite fitting, actually, for the book that we ended up making, just in that it's this you know, very orderly thing, but then my you know, chicken scratch handwriting kind of spilling out all over it. Um, but also, it, it kind of was nice to go back to this to see that a lot of the things that were important to us um, from the very beginning kind of ended up being integral parts of the book uh, and that kind of survived until the end of the process. Um, and then I thought it might also be instructive to show the book map that we were working with. Um, and the book, you know, in addition to the kind of material and you know, production decisions that I was talking about, um, there's also two different paper stocks, so the, the main projects are on a coded paper and the rest of the book is on uncoded paper. Um, and when you do that, you kind of have to figure out, um, as you know, we kind of end up spending a lot of our time doing, like how to structure things into an appropriate number of pages for signatures of each different kind of paper, and a signature being um, you know, a kind of gathered collection of 16 or so pages. Um, so, yeah, I think most designers who, who make books kind of end up creating things like this uh, that I think have a very kind of architectural plan view quality um, in order to just kind of organize their structures. Um, Architecture is All Over um, is another book that, uh, that we did with Columbia Books on Architecture in the City, um, the good folks up here on the fourth floor. Um, and this is a book that was edited by Esther Choi and Marika Trotter, and central to the book, um, as they say in their introduction, um, is, is the idea of you know, architecture at the turn of the century being subject to both diminishment and ubiquity simultaneously. Um, and that kind of like um, multivalent uh, binary is something that we wanted to really kind of fundamentally address in the design of the book. Um, in certain ways. And so one of the ways that we did that was um, creating these typefaces that um, are never quite forward or backward. They kind of operate bo in both directions. Um, the counters uh, are flipped in, in each of the letters that has one so that it's, you know, there's something about it that's always backwards or forwards. 
Um, we also have these title pages, which uh, on the back of the leaf, the title appears backwards, and on the other side of the leaf, it's forwards. Um, it's always black when it's kind of reading right, and fluorescent ink on the back side when it's backwards. Um, and then the same thing happens with the images. Um, so the images you know, are just black and white um, on one side, but then on the other side uh, appear in reverse in fluorescent ink, kind of running under the text. Uh, and so it creates this um, you know, kind of the texture that runs through the entire book. Uh, where, where something is kind of like a kind of ghost presence of an image is interfering um, with content that may or may not be related to it. So as much as this is like a very rigid structure, um, there's something about it that's also kind of uh, destabilizing or maybe a little bit potentially unwelcome, although we did a lot of tests to make sure that legibility of the text over the fluorescent was uh, good enough. <laughs> Um, there also are a few different grids we're using for a few different types of content, so there's another kind of uh, flexibility in the structure there as well. Um, the Princeton Public Library, uh, we did signage for the second floor of this space. Um, it was renovated last year by Andrew Berman Architect. Um, the building itself is not that old. It was probably from the early 2000s. Um, but already, um, the library started to realize that you know, the second floor wasn't quite serving 21st century patrons in the way that it should be. Uh, and so Andrew and his team um, really opened up the space and brought a lot more light into it uh, and changed the kind of circulation through the space, uh, in large part by pushing the, the stacks and, and the collection kind of to the walls, like making the walls out of the books, essentially. Um, so. In terms of the signage, we wanted to, to both kind of use the architecture as a substrate to not have um, lots of extraneous plaques floating around, but, but also to, to kind of take advantage of this idea of information and knowledge as physical structure. Um, and we made a distinction within the structure of the, the signage itself um, between collection-related signage and room naming and directional signage. Um, so anything related to the collection runs vertically. Uh, in the same orientation that the type does on the spine of a book uh, and uses a monospace typeface that's um, kind of from, from the world of the labels that you see on, on the spines of library books and, and uh, checkout cards. Uh, and then a compl complementary sans serif typeface uh, horizontally um, for all room naming and directional signs. Um, there also are these little fins um, that are on the shelves that divide larger categories into smaller categories that the librarians took to calling shelf talkers. Um, and so those uh, you know, kind of also follow the convention of running in the same direction as the, the collection information. There also are a number of um, kind of moments of larger signage, like uh, print and copy, which needed to be seen from like down the hall, so we made it enormous. <laughs> uh, and then some more subtle enormous type um, on, on the glass. Uh, and then lastly, in, in the study rooms, which are these little rooms that can be reserved by patrons, um, what, you know, these, these rooms are all glass, and so the librarians needed uh, a way to both provide privacy for patrons, but not too much privacy, uh, so that you know, kind of unsavory things could end up happen happening in there. Uh, so what we ended up doing here was um, kind of creating this custom film um, made up of a, a texture of letters, uh, and the letters are actually just the, the sequence of letters on a computer keyboard. Um, and so there's a kind of um, translucency to the film that kind of you know, provides privacy for those inside, but also allows a view into the room from the outside. And then we use the opposite strategy on the surfaces that needed to have more transparency as distraction graphics. <laughs> And the last project I want to talk about is a website for Keller Easterling. Um, and in Keller's work, um, you know, both her, her writing and her teaching and, and her design, um, language is very important. Um, she has a very particular vocabulary that, that always manifests itself in her work. And it seemed really crucial to latch on to that. Uh, and to kind of use that as the basis somehow of the structure of the site. Um, and so the homepage, when you first 
visit the site um, is kind of mostly blank other than a list of categories that seem fairly typical for a portfolio website. Um, but then as you click those categories and start to reveal some content, you notice that additional terms start to get added to the navigation. Um, so tags that are associated in kind of Keller's particular lexicon uh, with these, these entries, then uh, as you view them, get added to, to, uh, to this list. So the more content you reveal, the more terms uh, get added to the navigation. And uh, there's also a search function, so you can perhaps search for pandas and actually get a few results. Uh, and then your search term also gets added to that list. So it can become a you know, completely, um, a list that's both customizable, but also um, the, the structure of the list kind of reveals the traces of your path as you move through the website. Um, there are also some things that happen um, only as a result of inactivity. So if you're not using the site for a while, some things start to pop up, um, like magazine covers and certification seals and uh, webcams from all over the world. Uh, but then as soon as you interact with the site again, they all just disappear. Um, and then uh, the, the last feature is that uh, the only way that you can see all of the tags on the site is to go to the error page. Um, so it's kind of like a trap door in the site in, in the way that um, you kind of have to go somewhere that doesn't exist in order to see everything. Um, that's it. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> thanks to Yoon for inviting me to come and talk about Studio Lin's work. Um, Studio Lin is me and two or three other designers. And um, we do a lot of work with um, architects and artists and industrial designers and architects and a lot of other creative people. So uh, one project um, that I want to talk about is uh, some in-house print-on-demand uh, material for OMA New York. And so we started working with them um, early last year. And basically, um, it's really hard to talk to Sho because he's so busy. He's always like, you know, in some other country. And so uh, I felt like I really needed to understand his way of thinking and, and the way the office thinks. So basically, I watched every one of his YouTube videos. And uh, I learned a lot. And I think I learned more than if I had spent, you know, an hour with him in a meeting. So after kind of understanding um, OMA New York and trying to decipher his, um, his way of thinking, um, we wanted to come up some, with some qualities for these publications. So basically, the, the office has a list of 100 plus projects, and they need a way to document these projects in small booklets. And so these small booklets can be used internally because um, if they want to educate like a new architect on a project, they can just hand them this booklet. Or if they have clients that need to understand certain projects, they can give them these booklets. So the kind of two main qualities that we came up with um, that the booklets needed to kind of portray were this idea of uh, this brutal plus beautiful. Um, so that was like one important quality that the that the graphics needed to convey, as well as this idea of um, rigor, um, something being rigorous. So this is this list that they showed us at every meeting, and it was really scary. Uh, there's a lot of content. There's a lot of different categories. There's a lot of different dates. So the kind of system that we came up with for these publications had to incorporate like all this kind of information. Um, so we started really simply. Um, they showed us Excel sheets so much that we started thinking in the same way. Uh, so this is a kind of, just kind of cleaning up the information, but also keeping their categories, not trying to incorporate, not trying to introduce a, another way of thinking. So this is very familiar to, um, you know, this kind of Excel breakdown. So uh, so we started designing, and basically. Um, 
we took this kind of extremely no frills approach. So typography is always just kind of really straightforward. Um, OMA has a history of using Arial, so we said, you know, let's just keep on using Arial. Um, so we, and then we started adding some stuff. Um, so this, this is this idea that every building or project can be represented by this kind of icon. And so that icon can be like a floor plan, it can be like a diagram. Um, whichever kind of image represents that project the best, that's what we use on the cover. Um, and then we introduced like this really simple color system. Um, projects that are unbuilt are printed in white ink on top of the uh, text. Um, progress. Projects in progress are printed in gray and completed projects are printed in black. And then this starts to go into the content for each of the booklets. Um, so typically, like if, if an architecture office is talking about a project, someone writes the text and then there's a couple images. But after watching all these kind of YouTube videos, I thought that actually like the most compelling way to, to get this information is through this kind of storytelling method. So, um, so basically, Sho gives these lectures so much that every one of the important New York projects has like the perfect slide with the perfect text. And so he like does these lectures all the time. And so he's like refined the presentation of, of each of these projects. So we took that, we just took his slides and we took his transcribed text and that's the kind of content for the booklet. So these are just some sample spreads. Um, we number each one of the, we started calling these slides. Um, so uh, these are saddle stage books. So like in the middle of every book, you get this kind of continuous image. So we decided the center of each project booklet is just like a full bleed image. Um, we also incorporated stuff uh, found on Instagram, some images for each booklet. Um, and then the back cover of each booklet has all the images used in the booklet, and they're also kind of numbered. Um, this kind of came from the way that um, show kind of reviews content. And like, it's always in this kind of extremely dense thumbnail view because he, it's just like more efficient for him to kind of review content that way. So that's kind of what we picked up here. So again, every, project booklet has a kind of overview of every image along with a number. Um, so to counter that kind of density, we wanted to also introduce this idea of like zines. And so each of these zines are just like one kind of like dumb idea. So this is like all blue foam towers and just this booklet of blue foam towers. Um, these are all square plan projects and it's on a square book and so on. So we kind of devised a system for single project booklets and then we thought like, okay, like now they can be compiled to, to make these selected work booklets. So like if a client comes to them and they're like, oh, we're, we want to make like a, a new art project somewhere, like they can compile all the kind of art projects together and give them that booklet. So basically, um, one kind of real pet peeve of mine is not knowing the date that something was made. So it's, you know, obviously you can see uh, when things are compiled. <clears throat> also, um, because each booklet is like a, a kind of saddle stitch thing, um, when you wire it, it creates these kind of separations naturally. So you usually don't wire like a saddle stitch book, but um, why not? On the back of each um, one of these booklets is this kind of like Excel sheet type information as well as the kind of icon of the building. So that's, that's for OME. Um, the next project is a website for CCA, um, Canadian Center for Architecture. And so this project started in maybe 2014 or 2015. And the institution it's, itself is, uh, very different. They have some goals that are different than um, typical institutions or museums. So I, I'm just going to show like some really um, some really basic things, some visual things that kind of led to the website design. 
So the website itself is the basic structure is half of it is, or one part of it is um, themes and articles. So CCA publishes and, com and makes um, articles in writing and collections and exhibitions all around certain themes around ar architecture. So they have many, many themes, and so we wanted to give each theme a kind of color. So this original, um, this original idea is this color scheme is based on um, a Le Corbusier uh, palette for a Salubra, um, I think it's like a paint company or something. So this is our original idea for these, like how to kind of um, color each theme. Um, the other part of the website is purely institutional content. So like museum hours about history um, exhibitions. So we decided everything should be blue for institutional. So um, the Le Corbusier palette didn't really fly. Um, it was kind of too arbitrary. So we tried to come up with a system that could not be disputed. Like it's basically like scientific or something. So here, um, okay, we, we took this kind of, you, you can't really say, this is like a rainbow basically. And then we're taking all the blue and we're gonna reserve that for CCA institutional section. So then we're left with this. And then we're taking like basically every other, um, every fourth or fifth color and that's the palette. So um, just to show like if, if you approach things in a way that's like kind of purely logical, then it's harder to refute, it's harder to argue against. <laughs> <laughs> And then where it's like, okay, if each of these colors has to work for a theme, then type has to, you have to be able to read the type. And then this became um, the color palette for the themes. So um, then these are just some like, two slides from the still um, website design. So basically the home page has these cards representing articles within themes. Um, when you go into that theme, the kind of color palette comes from that theme. And then all the institutional section is, um, is basically blue. And this is kind of how it works. So now when you go into the institutional section, it kind of looks different than the themes. It's very uh, monotone. And then there's also the search. So, uh, so after making the website, um, we were kind of it kind of continued on into um, a lot of different print materials and on-screen materials. And so even though we didn't really make like a, this new identity for CCA, um, this, this kind of identity grew from just making the website. So basically everything's universe. Um, things that are related to the instit institution, we try and use blue. Um, things that are related to themes or outside um, content, we can use other colors. So the last project um, I'll talk about is our kind of ongoing collaboration with MOS. And so MOS is Michael and Hillary and they have maybe four or five architects that work for them. Um, so basically we, we did their identity first and then we did a website and now we're kind of working on publications. So uh, one thing, this was like, when Michael kind of talks about the studio and in their practice, um, sometimes they have these like rule things. And so like when I saw like, you know, they're interested in the banal or the boring that I was like so excited. Um, or like repeating things or like this collective sameness instead of individual expressive difference. So uh, I think as a studio we're we're not so interested in like making new forms. Like we, we use like four tie phases for everything. And uh, we're kind of more interested in maybe like the process or the kind of, um, or maybe like materials or I don't know, just not so interested in like forms so much. 
so this is the typical work process with MOS. Uh, it's basically the series of um, text messages. And because the design is so easy, we basically use accidents grow tests, tracked out 30 for everything. You don't have to you don't have to spend time on like, oh, he might not like the serif or because he knows it's gonna be accidents grotesque and it's gonna all look the same typographically. So th th this is what happens. Uh, I get text and I respond and it's like, do you like this? <laughs> sometimes he likes this, sometimes he's not sure, you know. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of trust because we're kind of on the p same page aesthetically and he knows it's not really gonna change, so. So this is how it all started. Um, this kind of basic identity was accidents, and we use like print on demand, like the worst, cheapest printing. <clears throat> and then, um, so as every architecture office needs, are these kind of um, booklets that uh, kind of spread their work and writing. So. Um, so we started by making the series of booklets with um, Lulu print on demand, which you guys probably know. And there's a lot that can go wrong with Lulu. Uh, you basically send your files and the cover files separate, and you just kind of like pray that it looks okay. So, uh, so what we tried to do is kind of like make something that wasn't bad. Um, so Lulu has problems with like printing type on the spine. So that's like. Let's not go there. Like there's no type on the spine. Lulu is kind of pretty bad at like chopping images or like full color images. So, but they're actually okay at printing like like just one solid color. So okay, like the cover is color and there's only type and there's you know no type on the spine, and so it kind of got rid of a lot of things that could go wrong. Um, this is like a interior of a textbook. Um, this is the kind of hard, so Lulu has a lot of different options. Like you can get a hard cover, soft cover, you can get it like six by nine or big or small. So we tried to kind of like map out their content. Like, okay, like if it's only text, let's use like the smallest, cheapest book. And then if it ha like has some images and you need to impress a client, let's make it like hard cover and um, full color on the inside. So. The, we just made a series of kind of log logical choices based on the content and the budget. Um, so sometimes we also do, uh, like for these various Biennale this, Biennale that, um, we have, we make books that are kind of more of a presen presence because when you're at these fairs, like a little dinky book's not really gonna have much presence. So this book was for, um, I think it was like an Istanbul Biennale, and basically I called the printer, these are all print on demand, like there's no publishers involved, so the quantity is always like, you know, 10 or 20. So I called um, this printer that does pretty good work, and I was like, what is the thickest book you can make? And he was like, oh, like 1,600 pages or something. So that determined the size, like, now we can make a 1,600 page book and it can be maximum like nine by 12. And uh, so that's what determined the size of this. The content is, um, is thousands of uh, scale figures without architecture. So I, I actually don't know when they have the time to be doing this, but they apparently have like thousands of scale figures without architecture, they, they, it's like photoshopped out. So this goes through, um, you know, a lot of those. For uh, Venice Biennale, we kind of did the same thing. We called the printer, like, okay, like, what is the biggest book you can make? And uh, this was like 20 inches by something, it's pretty big, it's really big. Um, so based on that, we made this really big book. And then we also do like fun stuff. So all of this, all of this is like print on demand. Like there's no offset printers involved. There's no large quantities. It's just kind of like online stuff. And uh, so mouse pads and like mugs. And... This one, um, they had this kind of exhibition of videos at Princeton and we watched, there were three videos, we watched the videos, they were really long, kind of really boring. 
Um, this one's like nine minutes of like monotone voice and like slow panning. And so we were trying to think of a way, like typically you just make a poster or something, but we use that budget to make these tote bags. And so when you go watch the videos, there's a gallery guard. And if you finished a whole video, then you can tell the gallery guard um, and they'll give you a bag. So it's a kind of like bribing people to watch the whole video. So uh, yeah, I mean, basically everything's really easy to design, um, same typeface. But I think it works because um, MOS's writing is amazing. Like the stuff that they write is, is like so full of ideas. The text is just, so great that um, that I think we can get away with this kind of like really straightforward um, design. That's it. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, I'm familiar with you know many of those these projects and some of them are new to me, but it's always nice to hear the kind of the inside uh, scoop and your kind of way of thinking. Um, so I wanted to just start with a, what I think is a softball question, but it might be a hardball question, which is a truth or dare question. How is it working with architects? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Judy, you want to start? Um, well, at this point, I've kind of gotten used to it. <laughs> um, you know, the usual, like the you know, the deadlines, impossible schedules. Uh, um, but because I think I, I enjoy it despite, despite that, because I really enjoy the content, as you can see, I, you know, make structural things as well. So, you know, just learning more and more about architecture and urban design and uh, planning, that's, Interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I. I think it's. There is some natural affinity I think I have with architects, and I don't know if I can totally explain it. I think it might have something to do with having been an engineer before being a designer. Um, so yeah, this kind of like. Uh, structural, systematic way of thinking seems like you know, something that architects spend a lot of time doing too, whether it's in design or um, kind of the more mundane aspects of their practice. Um, but I, yeah, I think more that it's not just a matter of like any architect though. I mean, I think for all three of us, like you could see from the work that we showed that um, for the most part, I think we tend to work with architects who, I mean, I said this earlier, but who are interested in engaging with ideas mm -hmm. and who are interested in someone else from the outside being able to, to kind of, <clears throat> I don't know, reflect those ideas back to them in a way that they can't necessarily conceive of. And so I think the people that, um, the really great collaborations are with the people who uh, kind of recognize that and come to us for that reason and recognize that we can add something to what they do that, um, I don't know, enhances it in a really significant way. Um, you know, there are also the other collaborations that <laughs> are more, um, I don't know, less fun to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I mean, I did, I, I don't know whether I mentioned this earlier or not, but like I, I do actually feel profoundly lucky that most of the people that we get to work with are people like you know the former, um, you know people who uh, kind of see us as partners and collaborators, and that we um, can really engage with the same things that they're thinking about, but just in kind of a different mode. Alex, do you find it different working with architects and other? Because I know that none of your studios are you know. Uh, exclusively working with architectural content or architects, you work with you know, lots of different kinds of content. Um, but do you find it different working with architectural content versus other kinds of content there is? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely different. 
but we apply the same kind of way of thinking. Like, it doesn't matter if it's architecture or photography or... Um, so, I think to us there's no difference, mm -hmm. but the difference is, like, if you're excited about their work, like, are you excited about, like, what you're trying to de design? Um, and also, I mean, like, MOS and OMA, they're, like, completely different. They're, like, so different that, um, I mean, in the end, I just, like, architects have it hard. They, like, <laughs> it's like, they, yeah, I mean, graphic design, like, in the end, I always feel like graphic design is, like, a walk in the park, like, compared to architecture. I really, I really do. It's just, like, so I feel fortunate. That <laughs> I mean, I thought it was interesting to compare the OMA um, example with the, with the MOSS example, just in that, you know, it, for one project, you showed screen captures of, you know, these kind of very intimate conversations between you and your client, mm -hmm. and, you know, which is emblematic of what kind of relationship you had right. there. Whereas with the OMA, you couldn't even, you know, be in the same room together for a long enough period of time to yeah. have a conversation. So you had to go to YouTube to watch these right. videos. Right. So how does that, how does that um, influence how you, you know, the, in one aspect uh, or in one case, you have this intimate access to mm -hmm. your client and the decision maker and the person that, you know, you want to uh, listen to. And then in the other case, you don't. How do you deal uh, with that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a lot more pressure, like the kind of OMA kind of scenario where you're, you're trying to like read his mind, you're trying to like figure out like what he would like, whereas like MOS, I'll just like text him, like, <laughs> do you like this? And he'll be like, no, or, you know. So uh, I think it's just like stress level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you worked on the monograph with uh, Amal and Dan for WorkAC, and you had said that you worked on it for a year and a half. Is that what you said? Something like that. Okay, yeah. so that's not you know that's not a short amount of time, and because of the nature of the book, book which is a monograph and it's their first monograph, I imagine that relationship was you know very close and um, sort of you know. Uh, sort of intertwined and also there's two of them and you really need to get to know their practice. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience there? Yeah, no, it, and it's this idea of the duograph, I think, came came out of the way that they work together. Um, just in that, like, they, I mean, I think, I think Dan especially likes to kind of play this up, but the kind of like almost cartoonish difference in their roles. Um, and and that, to some degree, kind of played out in the course of working on the book. Like, there were a couple of, maybe one moment in particular where I remember being in a meeting with them, and it was like, I very much felt like, um, like saying anything at all would be getting involved in a, <laughs> an argument that was not about architecture. <laughs> uh, I think that's how I want to put that. <laughs> so it became this like exercise and kind of navigating like um, those scenarios occasionally. But I think for the most part, like the working process was very fun and lively. And, and I think that really comes through in the design of the book too. Yeah. And I think when Amal was talking about this in Chicago uh, at the biennial on a panel, but just about how also our process of working together, um, I think like we each got something out of it in the end that we probably wouldn't have made without the other. That, that you know, that their impulses and my impulses were not sometimes always entirely aligned, mm -hmm. but that um, we kind of pushed and pulled uh, in our own directions and, and kind of it came out in a really the final form, I think, is quite synthetic, and I and I I don't think that that's. Uh, I hope it's not too apparent in the final form, um, but. Yeah, it was also. I mean, also, I think part of working with architects is like understanding that you're working with other designers. You know, that in some ways, it's not the same as working with. Um, you know, writers or 
uh, artists or, or someone you know, that, that has no relationship to form whatsoever. Yeah, and that and that they are dealing with clients all the time too, right. <laughs> in a way that other other people that we work with maybe don't. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, and, and in a way it kind of broke down in that Amal was mostly responsible for the images and Dan was mostly responsible for text. And mm -hmm. again, this like split between, between the two and uh, we're both kind of like crossing over that border now and then. But, um, and Amal, you know, given that, uh, I think, think kind of like show, like Amal is always just giving these presentations all over the place. And so her kind of um, natural habitat is PowerPoint. Right. So she would like set up these PowerPoint files of images and combinations and sequences and just kind of send them over. And, and then it would become a matter of like making the layout kind of do what the PowerPoint is doing. And, and that would always be the starting point. Oh, and, then we would, and then we would go in together and start saying like, well, this, this set of images doesn't really work here. Maybe it should move over to here or, you know, the, the, but, you know, it was collaborative, but it always started with like, here's the PowerPoint. <laughs> and then, you know, I would copy the PowerPoint file and change the extension to, to .zip and then extract <laughs> all of the images from the folder. So that's a great tip, by the way, if anybody <laughs> has to do this. Um, but yeah, actually, and, and we are now working on another project where we are receiving sometimes content only in PowerPoint. Like we're, we're really waiting for the, the real images to show up and poor Ben is sitting there like, you know, doing screenshots from a PowerPoint file and placing them into an InDesign file. And so it's like, uh, and that's not even an architect actually. <laughs> that's actually but. really uh, fascinating that you received all, of, all the content in the PowerPoint because I think, of, you know, a lot of designers, I certainly feel this way. I feel really scared of PowerPoint. Um, you know, just files because I didn't know what to do with them. Yeah. But just the, the fact that you had to extract these, the, this content from this very particular and finicky format, maybe, you know, it allowed you to design a certain way that you wouldn't. And when I first looked at the, the, the book, the unbound copy of that book, I thought, wow, Neil has gone really wild. <laughs> <laughs> and I think sometimes, you know, the best collaborations um, sort of result in something that you, is really unexpected from either party, but because right. those two parties met and pushed each other to do something, you know, you create, you know, something that's really surprising and, and shocking even. Um, Yeju, you had shown your, um, the, the piece that you had made as a collaborative piece um, for the Cambridge Arts Council, which is, you know, it's not a, a, a piece of design that deals with content per se, um, but it's more about the context. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that and the role that you had to play? Because you know, when I was introducing you guys, and I think this has become apparent through your presentations as well, which is that a designer often becomes more than just a designer, more than somebody that gives content form. You have to become the negotiator you know, in the room or the editor or the researcher or strategist. You, know, or you have to assume all of these roles. So, with that project, it seems like you had to assume many other roles besides just making something that looks visually pleasing. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about that project all night. Um, th that project actually started in 2013, and it, we completed the construction last year, last fall, but it's actually not done yet. We thought it was done, but there are some issues with skateboarding and a couple of residents not uh, being so happy with it. Or what was the brief for the project to start with? Well, basically, my collaborator, who's also a good friend of mine, Chad Treveso, and I just responded to this RFP that Cambridge Arts Council um, put out. But it was never really about designing a street, designing a path. It was just a public art project on this, you know, particular, particular block. Yeah, block. Uh, but then it was our idea to um, to suggest that maybe it should be just integrated into the infrastructure, and that is partly why it took so long because it had to uh, meet all the regu like all the city regulations because it's also permanent um, yeah. all the regulations and we went through many 
community meetings. We also, I mean, Chad and I are both educators and we are interested in kind of um, using that opportunity, the, the design process as an education uh, opportunity. So there's a school right by the site and as you saw in the video, there it's mostly kids who use that street to go back and forth the school and the park. So we did a series of workshops with the kids in the school uh, to actually like design the thing together. I mean, the original design was totally different from what you just saw, um, which I, I personally th thought that we ended up with like more boring sort of really simple design because um, originally it was about uh, different uh, materials. But anyway, so, you know, again, going back to your question, um, coming up with the concept, of course, um, designing the form, um, community engagement, also designing the process, in this case, workshops with the school kids uh, and actually doing it. Um, and then we worked with engineers uh, that the city hired and the GC, but we were involved in the construction uh, as well. We were there. Um, we brought in subcontractors to do the form work. Uh, we actually hired the skate park builders to do the mounds, um, as well as the uh, concrete company. Um, so like doing all that research while designing it, uh, constantly presenting the revision to the to various city departments, going back to revise it again. Um, and still now dealing with the issues, we, um, a couple months ago, we went back to uh, interview a bunch of residents to hear about their experience, actually like, you know, kind of camp out there to see what's actually going on. Uh, all these things. I mean, it's just really everything. I, I think you might actually just be doing architecture. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's very collaborative also. And luckily, my collaborator, Chad, was trained as an architect. He, he works more as an artist. but. In a way, you know, even designing three-dimensional uh, mounds, you know, I just kind of did it actually literally with clay, just making little things, kind of playing with it while chat's using, you know, whatever, 3D. Fancy software. <laughs> <laughs> software. But that kind of going back and forth uh, really works for us. And also our process is extremely, I mean, almost unimaginably collaborative. Even just replying to a client's, e to, you know, the commissioner's email, we like discuss it. Or even like just sending one text message back to the client, we discuss it. Like, is this, does this sound all right? Uh, yeah. Um, I thought the, the few sort of uh, projects or slides that you, you showed at the end, Alex, the stuff that you did for Moss, um, the book series that you uh, emphasize were made with, <laughs> through Lulu and there were only you know, a few copies print on demand, which you know, as designers that make books, we know that how restrictive that service can be um, because it's print on demand, it's cheap, you don't have to do a thousand run. Um, but I thought it was really inspiring to think about how you make those constra constraints, sort of the design you know, kind of principle or the kind of the starting point of these things, like how many pages can you print? What is the size? Oh, we can't print on the spine, therefore we won't do anything on the spine. Um, and I, you know, I find that uh, really sort of a kind of fun way to think about design. And I think as students, um, you know, maybe you guys can, uh, can identify with that a little bit because as, as students especially, you don't have access to commercial printing or these kind of fancy production methods. So you're always, you always feel bound by these constraints. Um, so I think as designers, we have to contend with, contend with constraints all the time, whether that's about production or other time constraints or budget constraints or whatever it is. So can you guys talk a little bit about how that um, influences your, your practice on a day-to-day -day basis? Maybe you can Constraints? Yeah. 
I mean, you also said that you, you use like four typefaces, which is kind of a self-imposed constraint of the studio. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think we love constraints, right? I mean, I love constraints. He's looking around the room. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sharon and Jenna are over I there. Um, I work with them at the studio. So, I mean, I think like, if a client comes and they're like, I love chalkboard typeface or some like horrible thing or whatever, that's great. Like that's one less decision that we have to make. And, <laughs> and that allows us like, like I want to push things past like the kind of visual, you know, like I think, um, I think we're interested in like maybe even the story behind it. Maybe it turns out like really whatever, but it's like the story that led to that like boring looking thing on the table. Um, so constraints, like, I love constraints, like. Whether that's self-imposed or it's uh, kind of, a, you know, forced upon you by the client's yeah, and I, whims. And I think the more extreme, the better. So if it's like, like you have to make a book and we only have 50 cents, you know, <laughs> what does that give us? Or, uh, yeah, I think constraints are the best. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I have to imagine that anybody who decides to be a designer kind of has to identify that with that to some degree. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I guess for me, it's kind of like, how do, you, how do you decide? Like, how do you make a decision? Because all design is, is like a series of small decisions. Like you keep making decisions and then yeah. something is done. And then you decide when it's done, actually. Or if someone else does. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a constraint. Right. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I, don't, I, I think a lot, actually, about um, uh, a classmate from grad school and, and uh, a friend, uh, Mary Voorhees Mian, always used to say in school, um, why does anything look like anything? And, <laughs> and that's like something that I actually hear her voice in my head saying that. <laughs> pretty often uh, because it's like you, you unless like you're a total formalist just like like playing with form for its own sake which I I know Alex isn't and and I don't Yeju isn't either really um, then then you have to have reasons for making decisions and sometimes those reasons are um, yeah totally arbitrary it's like we need to use the chalkboard typeface it's like Great, okay. <laughs> and I think, I think I've gotten, um, as I've gone on, like a lot less resistant to that sort of thing. Like I, I think I, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, I, I would have like had a wrestling match over the chalkboard type days. <laughs> but, but now it's a little bit like, sure, like what can we do with that? It's like, you know, I mean, it's very cliche to talk about constraints as opportunities. Um, but I think that we, and maybe it's just kind of like a general uh, attitude of positivity that I think we tend to, to have in the studio, but um, it's more like, okay, well, like, what can we do with this? Like, where does it go? This, like, if this has to be, then how do we make it the best thing it can be given that circumstance? Um, are there any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, before you mentioned that, I was going to ask about the, like, the kids that were skating the uh, street installation. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it? Uh, the, oh, I guess I mean, like, so you said it's not done now because that's, like, still a problem. Is, but you, but you, they must have known that you hired this construction company that was yeah that's that's what they that's what they construct like it was specifically like you know concrete yeah. forms for skating i to mean we all knew even the city staff we worked with they knew that skaters would love this and we we also know that it's not necessarily ideal uh for skating but um what we didn't know uh are two things one, 
how much the skaters would love this. <laughs> so like how many of them would come to skate there. And another thing that really surprised me, and I'm still torn by this, uh, is the how the residents in that neighborhood we have worked with who agreed on a lot of the values that we, you know, kind of presented, this like inclusiveness and, you know, all these things uh, and play um, would hate skaters. <laughs> um, so we didn't know that. And now that it's happening, we, I mean, we've heard about it only through well, after one of the residents kind of started sending letters directly to the city manager, uh, many times. Um, so the city manager basically made an order for us to make a physical modification somehow to deter skating. And um, well, we, after working on it for four years, we didn't, we didn't want to just agree with it, of course. And also it's a piece of, you know, public art also, like we, you know, we cannot just change it because someone doesn't like it. Um, so we, that's why we proposed this process of like outreach again, which includes of course residents, uh, but also the users, the kids. Uh, and also we ended up, uh, which became the sort of core uh, part of our research. Uh, in our most recent trip was to meet with all the skaters. Like we went to local skate shops and kind of gauge how, what they think about it. Um, so our sort of strategy right now is that we do need to make uh, some kind of modification because uh, the, otherwise the city can just tear it, tear it apart. They can just remove it. Um, we're gonna make some modifications, but how do we then find a way to still keep some of the skating activities, uh, but then maybe discourage like a really dangerous jumping in the air um, things. We also found a bunch of videos on Instagram on our site, on our street, which looked really great and we were very happy but um so kind of almost studying how people skate also like using our our thing uh so we are planning on actually working with uh you know people who are experts in skating but also know a lot about um design to work together to find a way so, somehow i don't know yet you should, you should talk to Alex. I didn't talk to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I think at one point we talked about like if we were architects, we would just build things for skaters. Oh like, man, yeah, <laughs> for sure. It'd be yeah, we'd pretend you know. Oh, I've never skated. Or like, <laughs> well, this form's fine. <laughs> I mean, one thing I also learned is that there are many people who got into architecture or even planning through skating because they experienced their built environment yeah. very differently and kind of take interest in that. Yeah. This, this actually seems like an example of, like, like constraints are great, <clears throat> but only when they come at the right time. Right. You know, like, when the constraint comes after the project's done, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then maybe it's not so great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am hoping that this constraint would, I don't know, lead us to somewhere that's interesting uh, or new we're rooting for you <laughs> thank you <laughs> any other questions okay then i'll end with one last question which is um so as i mentioned earlier on you know all the graduating students at gsap are required to put together their portfolios which means that they have to look at their body of work figure out which projects that they you know, think represent themselves, um, come up with some kind of sequence, some kind of look and feel, some kind of tone, make typographic choices, make material choices, and ultimately present this into a volume. Um, and I think, you know, there's many things that are hard about that, obviously, but I think dealing with your own work, your own creative output, 
and then putting something together um, and having enough of an objective eye. I, th I think it's very difficult, not only for students, but I think for everyone. Um, I, I know that at least 50% of us at this table have real trouble updating their website, <laughs> for example. <laughs> I'm included in the 50%. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a struggle, I think, for anyone. And so can you tell us a little bit about, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how do you objectively look at your own work? Do you have any advice for students when they, when they go through this process? Your faces indicate that you're very <laughs> puzzled and stumped no by advice. this. No. I actually, I mean, the whole thing I was talking about in my talk is, I don't know, one way of going about it. You kind of set your imaginary audience or a situation and how that communication would go. I mean, I do that a lot um, too. Like even in writing, letter writing is much easier for me when I know who's on the other side. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. So imagine an audience very specifically. Yeah. I mean, not the, it doesn't have to be a spe specific thing. I don't know. But you'll probably use the portfolio to, like, go to an interview. So, you know, this person might just, like, flip through the book. Like, I don't know. Like, do you want to hold a book? And, you know, in, in that case, the dimension of the book really determines how this person is going to interact with the book. Also, even like the thickness of the paper, uh, you know, all these things. If you imagine the situation where this thing you're designing is experience, I think some of the decisions can be made pretty easily. I think in terms of, I mean, the process that you described is one of, of assessing a, a body of work and then trying to figure out how to present it in a way that seems sympathetic to that work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, <coughs> in terms of the work that we do, I, I feel like I don't really have a chance to do that all that often these days. Um, but things like this actually are a great opportunity for it, where you, you kind of have a chance to think like, well, what is it that I want to say with all of these mm -hmm. things that I'm showing, and how do, I, how do I kind of draw a line around them or through them? And I, and I guess. Maybe that would be my advice, is like try to draw like the biggest line around your work that you can. See, see if you can find a way to kind of like encompass a lot of it. Um, because I think it's, it's only, at least thinking back to when I was a student, it was only when I kind of like zoomed way out that I started to make some sense of the things that I was making. Um, when I was thinking too specifically about using that, that line or that circle as, as a way to actually make things. I only made things that were terrible. Um, it was just too forced. So, so it was only when I kind of stepped step back and thought about like, well, what holds all of this stuff together? And, and that can get you into really kind of general vague territory, but, um, but then you can kind of get more specific and think about what doesn't fit into that narrative. Um. I think architecture is hard enough. Like you should work with a graphic designer. Or something <laughs> to... Hire a designer. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's um, it's like I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try and like build a house that's any good without some expertise. I mean, you you guys might not be in the position to do that, but it's important. Like I think like, like with MOS, they have like they have a clear understanding of like what graphic design can do um, and different expertises where, yeah, they'll reach out, they'll be like, is this typeface one point too big? Or like like little like kind of ridiculous things. But, um, but I mean, I don't know how, like just thinking back when I was a student, like it's, it's tough, like, but like give yourself like one goal, like I'm just gonna make it really easy to understand or I'm just gonna make it you know if you're too ambitious with with things it just gets out of control so if you give yourself some limitations you know like I think um, that might help 
to have a clear goal to sink yeah. I think that's good advice. Okay, well, I want to thank you guys again for making time on this Friday evening. Um, and we have more lectures tomorrow and Sunday, so um, stay tuned. Um, thank you again. Thank you.